Hey everyone, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight for this time of Bible study. I've been looking forward to this all day. I've been actually meaning to have this posted uh, much earlier, but it seems like every time I try to start recording, I can't get like past minute one or two without tearing up or um, just kind of struggling through what I want to say. And so I've, I keep stopping and starting over, but I finally decided, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go for it. So um, you're going to have to forgive me if I get teary through this. Um, I think it's just the nature of, of what we're going through and um, just the uncertainty of, of the days. And, and it's just been um, heavy on my heart, as I'm sure it's been heavy on yours. But all the more reason to delve into this subject of encouragement, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, I love getting together on Wednesday nights with my church family. I especially love Our Lady's Bible class. We are currently working through the Hope Island Bible study book. And tonight, um, the chapter that we would have been covering together is the chapter on encouragement. And so I just felt like, you know, if maybe if I recorded that and, and put that lesson out there, it would um, be helpful to, to the ladies in my class. And then I thought, well, it might be helpful to, to many others. So um, I'm putting this out here for, for anybody to watch. And I hope that maybe you will benefit from something that you hear here. Um, I hope that maybe it will encourage you and, and then in turn, um, you will go out and encourage others. And, and that is hopefully what will, what will happen as a result. As I was getting ready for this lesson, and let me tell you this too, you're going to um, you're going to be experiencing this as if I were teaching a class. So this is unrehearsed, and so I I apologize if I fumble a little bit or if I seem a little bit scattered. I have got my Bible right here, and I have my book here, my notes here, but um, I am just going to talk to you for a little bit and um, share some thoughts with you about this wonderful subject of encouragement. Anyway, I was looking through my Bible and flipping through some, um, flipping through it and came across this little note that I want to show you. It is a note that is from my husband that he put between the pages of my Bible months ago. It's been a, it's been a while back. It says, thank you for all you do. And as I saw that today, I thought, you know what, I'm going to show that on my video because this serves as a little note of encouragement for me. It continues to encourage me. When I read those words, thank you for all you do. It makes me want to keep doing whatever he's thanking me for doing. It makes me want to be a better wife. It makes me want to be a better mom. It makes me want to be a better friend, a better daughter, a better sister. It just makes me want to be a better Christian. And that's what encouragement does. Encouragement motivates people to be more and more like Christ. Not just the giver of encouragement, but also the receiver of encouragement. It has this wonderful two-sided benefit. Uh, the, the encourager is, is benefited and, and so is the person who receives the encouragement. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But I just saw that note and, and thought I would share that with you because what it, of what it still means to me every time I see it. First of all, when we talk about encouragement and, and the way that we read about encouragement in the Bible, the first thing that we have to realize is that it is not just a suggestion. Encouragement is a command in Scripture. It is something that Christians are told to do. Um, in Romans chapter 15, verse 14, it says, admonish one another. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, it says, exhort one another daily. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, it says, exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Encouragement is necessary and it is commanded. It is commanded because of the wonderful result that comes from encouragement. Encouragement can drive away feelings of despair, feelings of discouragement, of uselessness, of loneliness. 
It can offer someone just what they need to hear at just the right moment, whether they want to hear it or not. It is like a little gift of grace that we give to someone with the intent of drawing that person closer to Christ. Encouragement is a wonderful, beautiful thing, but it is a necessary thing. On the top of my board here, I have written encouragement equals oxygen. Encouragement equals oxygen. That's because encouragement is like oxygen for the church. When we think about our human bodies and when we think about um, our reliance on oxygen, it kind of completes this picture for us. In the human body, oxygen is life. We require it. When oxygen levels are low, the body will begin to suffer. When oxygen levels are low, we see somebody might become short of breath. They might become restless. They might um, become confused. Their heart rate might increase. Their blood pressure might increase. And ultimately, without oxygen, the physical body will die. The comparison is this. Oxygen is vital for the church. Without encouragement, without encouragement, if it is absent or if, if it is failing, then the body of Christ, the church will suffer. Encouragement helps keeps, keep our hearts steady. It, help, it helps to keep our minds clear. It keeps our spirits strong. Encouragement supports the life of the church. We need it today more than ever. And so let's talk specifically about a few reasons why we need encouragement. And so if you're taking notes, then you might just write um, one through four on your sheet, and then you can take notes under each one of those things. I will list them out on here, and we'll go through each one of them and talk about why we need encouragement. Number one, we need encouragement because times are troubling. Times are troubling. So you might just write that on your paper. Times are troubling. The fact is that we live in a fallen world. We live in a place that is characterized by sin. It is characterized by suffering and by futility and, and by death. We know that our world is broken and um, it is ruled for now, for now, by the Prince of Darkness. And um, he has filled hearts with, with bad things, with evil things, with selfishness, with guilt, with hate. And we live in bodies that are dying. We have physical challenges. We also might feel pressure every day to conform to the world's standards. And we have this struggle constantly between the, the spirit and the flesh. And it's hard, but it really shouldn't come as a surprise because the Bible has told us that these things will be that way. Um, the Bible has promised that we will have suffering. First Peter chapter four, verse 12. In second Timothy chapter three, verse 12, we are promised persecution. And in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, we are promised various trials. These are reasons why we need encouragement. Y'all, you can just turn on the television. You can just look at news feeds on social media, and you can see um, this world of, of trouble. You can see this world of misguided souls, and, and it is sad, and it is scary sometimes. Um, it, it's it's sad to see trends in depression, trends in anxiety, and in stress, in suicide, especially among our young people. It is it is very very sad, and it is um, it's disheartening. People need to know that that they belong somewhere. They need to know that they are needed. They need to know that they are valued. They need to know that they are loved. They need to know that they have purpose. They need to be encouraged. And it's not just young people. Adults, too, um, go through 
very difficult trying things, very difficult um, experiences, uh, discouragement. Sometimes, you know, even if maybe you're not discouraged to the point of going out and choosing a life of sin, it might just make it hard for you to get up in the morning. Discouragement might make it hard to carry on throughout your day without feeling like you're lost or you're defeated. The truth is that we all need encouragement because encouragement makes it easier to live in a fallen world. So times are troubling, yes. We know that, we promise that it's going to be that way, but encouragement makes it easier for us to live here. Secondly, hearts need lifting, hearts need lifting. That's number two. I love this idea, and I love talking about this because this is so important. Because biblical encouragement is more than just complimenting someone or doing something nice for someone. That is important. Please do not misunderstand me. That is wonderful. A, a compliment, um, something that is said, a word of encouragement is wonderful and needed. And that can make your day better. It can make it brighter. It can lift somebody's load. But encouragement that we read in scripture has a greater purpose. And so if you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn over to Colossians chapter 4. So turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 4. And I want us to read a few verses about a man named Tychicus. And so looking in um, chapter 4, starting in verse 7, I'm going to read um, verses 7 and 8. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. This is Paul writing um, to the uh, Colossians. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Encouragement is shared with the intent of comforting the heart. Now that is beautiful. So let's talk for a second about what that means. How is a heart comforted? First of all, the, the word in, in chapter um, 4, verse 8, there in Colossians, comfort is means encourage. Encourage your hearts. And hearts here, of course, is that idea not of the physical heart, but the idea of the mind, of the very character of someone. It is the inner self, the inner man, the will, the intent of somebody, uh, the very center of who you are. So Paul is saying, Tychicus, I'm sending him to you that he might know your circumstances and that he might encourage the very inner self of you, the very center of who you are, your mind. He can strengthen and encourage and comfort your will. That is so strong and so meaningful and so deep. I want us to think for a minute, how do we do that? How do you comfort someone's heart? Well, there's lots of ways and there's many things that we can think of. We can remind each other of God's promises. We can remind each other of our blessings. We can remind each other of the evidences in our lives of God's providence. All right, we can also um, comfort each other's hearts through the company of our friends and our family. We can comfort each other through words of hope and love, through reading and meditating on the word of God. These are ways that we comfort the very center of each other, the very the very will and, and intention of, of ourselves. This type of encouragement keeps eyes focused on heaven and it gives spirits the will to keep 
pressing on. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite stories. Um, some of you may have heard this before if you've heard me speak on hope, um, but it's one of my favorite stories about my son, my son Briggs. One night I was, um, I was working at the hospital as a supervisor and I had had a particularly bad night. It was very stressful. Um, I can't even remember what all happened that night, but I remember coming home that morning and just standing against the counter in the kitchen and just bawling, just boohooing, tears coming down my face. Um, it was just, uh, it, it was like coming home and, and I was discouraged and I was sad and I felt very defeated. Um, it was a hard night, a hard situation. And I just remember coming home and feeling depressed. And so I'm standing there in the kitchen and I hear my son coming down the stairs from his bedroom. And he's coming down the stairs. I'd worked a night shift. And so it was morning. He's coming down. He walks into the kitchen and he looks at me and he sees that I am distraught. <laughs> and he comes in front of me and he opens his arms like this. And he says, get in these arms. And he just wrapped me in the hugest hug and he just held me. And I'm telling you in that moment, that's what I needed. I needed somebody to stand in front of me and say, just get in these arms. <laughs> just let me hold you. And in doing that, my little boy comforted my heart, comforted my heart. That's the kind of encouragement that we need to give each other. Much more than just a compliment here and there, those are wonderful and we need compliments and we need to, I know I need compliments. I need people telling me I look nice and that, you know, um, I, just things that, that, that will make me smile. I need that. But encouragement is given with the, with the intent of encouraging the heart. And so we, we are in desperate need of that. Um, in the New Testament, we find that encouragement was a regular part of what New Testament Christians did. Um, that was just part of their life together. They encouraged each other. There are many, many, many references in the New Testament about how the church shared words of exhortation and comfort in order to motivate each other. They did that in order to motivate each other to continue walking in faith, in hope, in unity, in joy, in strength, in perseverance, and with the assurance of Christ's return. They continually exhorted each other, reminding each other of these things so that they could stay focused and so they could keep doing what they were doing, keep living for Christ, keep living for his return. And, and that was what got them through. And the church today needs to make encouragement a regular ministry. It just needs to be part of who we are and what we do. Without it, we get overwhelmed. Without it, we are burdened. Without it, we can lose focus and we can lose direction. So, God says be encouraging. Be encouraging to each other. Remind each other often, you are loved. You have everything you need. The Bible says you are thoroughly equipped and you are treasured by God. Remind each other that. We need to stand in front of each other in these hard times and say, come here and get in these arms. What would the result of that be? I'll tell you, it would be beautiful. It would be growth. It would be joy. It would be all, all good, all good things. So number three, why do we need encouragement? Because when we do, we imitate a wonderful man that we read about in the Bible, Barnabas. So Barnabas imitating. We need encouragement because times are troubling, hearts need lifting, and Barnabas imitating is what we should strive for. So that's number three. 
Barnabas imitating. We know Barnabas in scripture as being the encourager. His name actually means the son of encouragement. And um, we read about him in the book of Acts. And so I want us to really quickly look at Barnabas and think about the example that he has left us in scripture about how to be an encourager. So in Acts chapter four, if you've got your Bible, flip over to Acts chapter four. Acts chapter four and starting in, let's see, verse 36. We're gonna kind of skip around all in this area right here. But in verse 36, we learn that um, Barnabas was a Levite from Cyprus with the given name of Joseph or Joseph. Um, we learn that he was a wealthy and generous man. Um, he earned the wonderful nickname of Barnabas because of his character. And I love that because you just have to imagine how much of an encourager he had to have been for the apostles to say, you know what, we're not even going to call you by your name anymore. You are such an encourager that we're going to call you Barnabas because that's, that describes exactly who you are. And it makes me think, okay, what would my nickname be? If I were given a nickname to reflect my character, what would it be? What would yours be? What would your nickname be? If somebody said, you know what, we're going to call you blank in order to honor your ability to do that thing, what would your nickname be? It's something to think about. So looking at Barnabas, for the church to have a heart of encouragement, we need to have a heart like Barnabas. That is um, where we're going to go with this, these next few thoughts right here. Let's see what we can learn about Barnabas from his, from his life and how we can maybe apply that to our own life. First, Barnabas is described in Acts 11, chapter 24. Turn over there really quick. Acts 11, verse 24. Look at the way Barnabas is described here. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. I actually probably should have scooted back and read verse 23. Um, and in fact, we could probably read that whole entire section right there when it's talking about Barnabas. But the first thing that I want us to know is that to see that character that Barnabas had. First, we should be good. We should be full of faith and led by the Holy Spirit through the word of God. We can learn that about Barnabas first. The church recognized those qualities in him. And they chose him because of those qualities to go and encourage the believers that were in Antioch. Antioch and that's exactly what he did. And so um, we learn first that these characteristics were important and allowed him to be an encouragement to other people. The fact that he was good and full of faith and led by the Holy Spirit. So that's number one. Number two, we learn that we should be excited for the cause of Christ and the spreading of the gospel. In Acts chapter 11, go back a little verse into verse 23. It says, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. Barnabas arrived in Antioch, <coughs> excuse me, and he witnessed the grace of God and it made him glad. And he encouraged the church there by telling them that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. And then later in the end of the next verse, we're, we read that a great many people were added to the Lord. Barnabas was doing wonderful work for the kingdom. He was doing great things for the church. And it was through his encouragement, through the very character of, of Barnabas, through who he was and his ability to uplift people, to lift up hearts, to comfort hearts. The church was growing as a result of that. So then finally, we learn from Barnabas that we should love people and not things. We should love people and not our stuff. Because of Barnabas, the needs of fellow Christians were met. Turn back really quickly to Acts chapter 4, 
verses 32 through 37. This is where we're reading in, in this little area right here about some of the needs that people in the church had and how those needs were being met by fellow Christians. And we read here that Barnabas met the needs of those people. And so going back up in, in starting in verse 32, it says um, they had the, the members of the church had all things in common. Nobody said that the things that they possessed were their own. And there wasn't anybody among them who lacked anything because everybody who had possessions shared them, came and brought them to be distributed among people who had need. And Barnabas, having land, in verse 37, he sold it, and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet for the very same purpose, for it to be distributed among people in need. Now, let's just stop here for a second. Let's just stop here and make a very, very modern-day application here. These early Christians did not say that anything they possessed was their own, but they had all things in common. Y'all, in this time where we're seeing this, this, this tendency to hoard, to go out and buy up everything in the stores, please, please think about this verse. Think about this example of Barnabas who said, you know what? Let me be mindful of the people who are in need. Let's not look at our stuff as if it's our own because it's, it's not. Let's be very willing to lay down the things that we have to, to give to others who are in need. It's times like this that Christians should shine. Christians should be stepping up and Christians should be saying, hey, who needs, who needs something? What can I do? What can I give? What can I do to serve people who are in need? Very, very important. That was an encouragement. That is a heart of an encourager because that action, the result of that action is going to bring people closer to Christ. It was also because of Barnabas that the Apostle Paul was first accepted by the church in Jerusalem. It was because of Barnabas that Mark was given a second chance as a missionary of the gospel. He genuinely cared about people. Encouragers care about people, not things, not possessions. That's a wonderful lesson that we learn from Barnabas. Barnabas loved Jesus and he loved the church. He wanted to see the church grow and he did things to make that happen. He was a man of deep conviction, willing to serve the Lord however the Lord wanted to use him. Barnabas was a wonderful example in scripture and back in that time to the people that were around him. And it's amazing how he continues to touch people and to bless people's life because of his example of encouragement. So be an encouragement because when, be an encourager because when you do, you are Im imitating one of the greats in scripture, Barnabas, the son of encouragement who did so much good for the Lord. And then number four, why encourage? We encourage because God is waiting for you to do it. God is waiting. That means start now. That means start encouraging now. Becoming an encouraging person is something that you choose. You make a choice to be an encourager. We talk a lot about talents. We had a whole other chapter, a whole other lesson that was on talents and abilities. And sometimes people can sometimes struggle thinking, what is my talent? What am I good at? What am I supposed to be doing? What is my ability? How is God supposed to be using me? I don't really know what my gift is. Well, let me tell you something. You can be an encourager. Everybody has that talent. Everybody has that gift. You and I choose 
to have a heart like Barnabas. We choose to be encouragers. God is waiting for us to do that because God loves people and God wants people to be encouraged. So if we do that, the church will grow because people want to be loved. They want to be nurtured. They want to be supported. They want to believe that they can be better, that they can be stronger, that they can be happier, that they can be purposeful. And they should see that coming from the people that are a part of God's family. And so it's very, very important that, that we um, make the choice to be encouragers. Um, many years ago, when my daughter was in third grade, and I know some of you have heard this story. I know that you have, but I'm going to tell it again because it's another one of my favorites. But uh, several years ago, my daughter Kate had an assignment in class where she had to choose a hero to describe to her classmates. Um, the assignment involved um, the students drawing a picture of their hero and describing in a few words why they chose that particular person. Well, I was so touched that Kate chose me as her hero. She chose me as her hero and when she brought home her picture, I looked at my portrait on there and I loved it and I admired it and it was lovely. And I was excited also to see that she had written an acrostic on the side next to the picture that she had drawn of me. She had drawn an acrostic using the letters M-O-M. M-O-M. And here's what she wrote. The first M stood for my hero, my hero. The O stood for only everything good, only everything good. And the last M in mom next to that, it said much more kind than last year. Much more kind than last year. <laughs> What? I read that and I was like, wait, hold on a second. This was going so good. My hero, only everything good, much more kind than last year. And Kate quickly said, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I meant that you keep getting kinder and kinder and kinder. But um, we really laughed hard and we have had good laughs about that over the years, about that year that I was kind of off a little bit and maybe wasn't as kind as I should be. But um, anyway, I'm telling you that story because words of encouragement that are written down are meaningful. It is meaningful. I keep every single sweet note that my children ever give me. I keep every card that has been sent to me from a brother or a sister in Christ. I have kept cards from my family. The reason I do that is because sometimes there are those moments when I like to go back and read those things. People need to hear that they're appreciated. They need to hear that they are loved. It's uplifting and it is motivating. And sometimes when I am discouraged, I can look at that picture that Kate drew and I can remember that I am somebody's hero. And then I can be inspired to act like it. That's what encouragement does. Encouragement makes you want to be better. It makes me want to be better. That's the, that's the end result of encouragement. It is words of comfort that are given to you with the intent of helping you become better. And the way that we want to, be, to become better is to become more and more like Christ. Listen, encouragers bring out the best in people. They support each other, they lean on each other. And how do they accomplish that? How do we do that? Let me give you some ways. Please listen to these ways that we can support and lean on each other. Number one, we can listen. Encouragers listen in a way that makes people feel understood. They lift each other's up, they lift each other up using God's word, the truth of God's word. They are patient, they are slow to judge. They are slow to judge. They take time for others 
and they make others feel special. Encouragers weep with those who weep. They rejoice with those who rejoice. They are sincerely happy for the personal victories of other people. And they are sincerely concerned when others are struggling or hurting in any way. They seek to see the perspectives of other people. They take time to hear and understand where other people are coming from. They speak with Proverbs 16, 24 in mind. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. They say, they use nice, kind words. God gives us comfort so that we might be a comfort to other people. As we close out this lesson, I want you to turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tri tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We comfort others because God comforts us. Ask yourself every day when you wake up in the morning, what can I do today that will lift someone's heart closer to Christ? Be an encourager. We need it in these times. We need more encouragers. We're going to get through this. God is in control. God knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows what's he knows what is coming tomorrow. He knows what's coming next year. Nothing surprises him. And he is holding this all in the palm of his hand. What can you do? What can I do today to lift someone's heart closer to Christ? I wish you the very best. I wish you peace and I wish you love. I, um, I love you and I, I pray that you stay encouraged. Be an encouragement to other people. Have a great night.